am standing on the Saginaw Bay, which runs into Lake Huron. This frozen water is a reminder of the glaciers and that the Great Lakes were formed by one huge frozen lake that eventually turned into the Great Lakes. And of course, the glacier that came down scoured out the ground and moved things around and left glacial waters. The Great Lakes really depends on snow melt and rain to keep alive. I'm here at Lake Michigan. It's the first day of spring. This lake is coming back to life after a long winter. You can see the ice is melting, the snow is melted, it's replenishing the lake. The snow melt and the rain keeps this lake alive. I will bet you that today there are still some glacial waters mixed in with the, the circulation of the rain and snow that happens here on an annual basis. This lake is alive. It's been said that water is life. It's also been said by Mark Twain that water's for fighting and whiskey's for drinking. You know, humankind's relationship with water has determined the fate of civilization since Roman times. It will continue to do so. And giving this the attention it deserves is of central importance to our society. So here we are in Lake Erie, which is the fourth largest lake of the Great Lakes, 11th largest lake actually in the world. It's about 210 feet deep. The water passes through here quite quickly from Lake Huron into Lake Ontario. This lake has been one that has had to deal with a great deal of agricultural runoff, industrial pollution. It's been a lake that was harmed very much by human presence. It's improved mostly because of changes that have been made in the way water is treated, but also because people recognize the importance of this water for sustaining life in this region. It's a lake that has been probably given a second chance, and that's important. We need to keep these freshwater lakes alive, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that they don't die. Uh, because once they die, bringing them back to life is gonna be very difficult. Well, you know, here in the Great Lakes, we have so much water that um, we often don't think about this one water concept. As much as they will in the West, where there's a, you know, a huge water stress, and they're yeah. talking about, you know, restricting the Colorado River for the first time to, you know, to the uh, southern states. But um, we really should be. Quamanum Falls is part of the watershed that feeds into Lake Superior. And as you can see, this water comes filtered through the woods. The rain brings it down, it's winter snowpack. This kind of water feeds into Lake Superior, which feeds into Lake Huron, which feeds into Lake Huron, and then into Lake Ontario. What we realize is that this is all connected. 
the water system in the Great Lakes is connected. There isn't one body of water. It is the Great Lakes and the great rivers and streams that make up this amazing watershed of fresh water, which keeps this environment in such a state that uh, would not exist without it. Think about where I am. I'm not in a desert. Uh, these are not dying plants. This is alive. This is nature alive. Full growth forest. Animals all over the place that are living in this, as well as people who live in this Great Lakes Basin, the millions of people who are sustained by the water, by the environment. Uh, this is what makes the Great Lakes region so spectacular and why it is so important to do everything we can to manage it so that it doesn't become a wasteland. Lake Superior is the largest of the Great Lakes. What Lake Superior does for the climate is it moderates it in many ways. It provides water that comes down from the Canadian north through the lake system and eventually ends up going out into the sea. We have an abundance of water in uh, the Great Lakes region. Coming up this river and dropping off the American Falls, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie feed into this Niagara River. This is an example of the abundance of water that we have, yet we don't entirely use this water in our best interest. And we need to look at how we can take full advantage of this amazing, this amazing natural resource, uh, not just now, but into the future. This water that flows through here is the life of the Great Lakes, right here happening in front of us. Uh, it's an amazing sight, something that is just wonderful to know that we have. There are parts of America that are blessed with abundant water resources, and in those regions, the idea of conservation doesn't really make much sense. At the same time, there are water-scarce regions where we're withdrawing at non-sustainable levels from aquifers, and the population has grown to the point that literally the only path forward is to recycle and reuse our sewage uh, for drinking water and potable water purposes. So depending upon the part of the country you're in, the issue of water quantity varies dramatically across that spectrum. You know, because water flows in a cycle and it's all connected. And, and I always thought this was interesting because, you know, we, we get taught the water cycle, like it's a natural uh, system which it is, but humans have now interjected themselves in, you know, into the water cycle. So it's not, you know, it's not this natural water cycle anymore. It's a coupled human natural system now. And everything from, from climate change impacting the way precipitation and temperatures and storms happen to, you know, to how we move water around and distribute it. Uh, from one place to another or over pump groundwater. So in this area, I think in particular in the Great Lakes region, we should be thinking about this one water concept in regard to these high intensity precipitation events, our storm water flows, and our natural water resources then that we use for, you know, economic development in this area, our beautiful beaches, our beautiful clean water. So uh, we should definitely be thinking about one water in the Great Lakes region, even though we have a lot of water. So one of the uh, problems with climate change is that there's rising water levels. Here at Lake Ontario, for instance, we can see that the beach is closed. And 
there is erosion taking place to the beach. And this is happening along all the Great Lakes. The beach erosion is causing major damage, but in some ways it's also changing the habits of people who are inclined to want to use these kinds of resources. As these changes take place and are accelerated by climate change, more and more people are going to find themselves with uh, serious issues that they weren't expecting. Yeah, if you look at the, the risk index um, and, the, and the, the big impact on cities in billions and billions of dollars, in addition, it's these climate impacts. It's floods, then droughts, then of course these events, these extreme events, hurricanes, tornadoes, all of these types of weather phenomenon. So one of the best examples I can make about infrastructure is Hurricane Sandy. Uh, Hurricane Sandy was obviously a big storm, but had it arrived maybe 60, 70 years ago, would not have caused nearly as much damage as it did. And that's because we've had uh, most of a foot of sea level rise in that time. And, and some people will say, well, a foot, that doesn't sound like very much sea level rise. But those extra few inches of sea level on top of the storm surge that Sandy brought to, for instance, New York City, was enough to put that water into the New York subway. So suddenly a storm that would have been uh, a relatively minor impact decades ago suddenly becomes a $30 billion uh, destructive force in the city uh, because the infrastructure was simply built for a different set of assumptions uh, than what we're now seeing today. And we're seeing that kind of, uh, that kind of failure of our infrastructure in highways, in bridges, in roads, in dams, along coastlines and throughout the heartland of America. It's that little extra bit that just puts, if it puts the water over the top, suddenly the systems that, that served you for decades uh, are no longer functioning. We've got to look at, as we build our infrastructure, can we, can we make the, the infrastructure as, uh, as part of our assets, right? resilient to these extremes. And a perfect example here in, in uh, the Midland area of Saginaw Valley is uh, our recent dam failures that uh, occurred in Edenville and Sanford dams. Those dams were, yes, poorly maintained, absolutely, but uh, we've had uh, an increase in extreme precipitation events in the Saginaw Valley of almost 50% in the last 30 years. And that additional, more frequent stress from those precipitation events uh, eventually is gonna show up in the weakest link. And when the weakest link is a dam that is 100 years old and hasn't been maintained, that's where you can expect to see a failure and that's what we saw. And it was a massive, massive cost to the community, a massive, massive cost to many homeowners and that is the kind of thing where we're gonna to start to see climate change really impact us in the future. We're not gonna see, I don't think, calm weather like we've had in the last 50 years. One of the problems we face is that many of our water treatment facilities are aging. They were built at a time when water treatment was more of a process of just chlorination and taking the water out of the lake and moving it into the community. But we need more sophisticated water treatment and water analysis. I really am supportive of this infrastructure bill. Let's work on water quality first. Let's make that our first priority. Let's make sure that the water we drink, the water we have for all of our purposes is, is managed, that we have a water quality index to warn the public, and that we do water quantity measurements on a daily basis so that we know how much of it do we have. Do we have enough for all of us and for how long to sustain us? This is a big challenge and we can do this but we're gonna to have to work together. With 
the bipartisan infrastructure law and with Build Back Better, we recognize that clean water is a national issue, has national policy implications. And so we supply a lot of resources to communities through the Clean Water uh, Revolving Loan Fund, the Clean Drinking Water Revolving Loan Fund, which is administered at the state level, so that they can invest in their water systems without having to pass all of the cost on to their customers. That's especially important in impoverished communities with population loss and older water systems. We need to invest in new water treatment centers so that the water that we drink is not only good, but stays that way when it gets to people's homes, which means we have to replace some of the infrastructure also. And at the point of use, we have to provide a way for people to be sure that they can filter out any of the impurities that these plants may not be able to actually take care of. So it's, it's a long-term process. It's a big challenge in order to fix these facilities or replace them. And we have to do it. It's a once in a lifetime investment and the time has come to reinvest in our water treatment facilities. The issue of regulation and control when it comes to water systems is, is very interesting. If you have your own private well, as many Americans do, you're on your own. There's, there's no laws. It, you have to protect yourself. And then if you're in the biggest cities, of course, you're subject to the most stringent regulation and monitoring requirements, and that makes sense because one water utility could literally control the water of 10, 15 million people. And you have everything in between. And so how to deal with that is very imperfect, but generally speaking, the smaller your system is, right down to the situation where you own your own well, the responsibility on you, the consumer, goes up. And if you live in a larger city, uh, the water company tends to take more responsibility. In the city of Detroit, the Great Lakes Water Authority is responsible for managing the water that comes into the Detroit metro area. Like many water authorities, it has a responsibility to service the population with clean drinking water. What we have in most of the Great Lakes region are water authorities that use the EPA guidelines for managing water in terms of testing and measurement. The challenges for all water authorities throughout the Great Lakes region is how to maintain quality drinking water and water that is useful for other purposes at a reasonable cost. The other problem that the Great Lakes Water Authority faces, like most communities, is aging infrastructure. Pipes that are over 100 years old, systems that are no longer efficient, you know, water treatment plants, water testing areas that need to be upgraded. So the challenge for all of the communities in the Great Lakes Basin is to step it up to improve the quality of water and to do so in a way that is affordable for the people that they're serving. Without an investment in infrastructure, however, the Great Lakes Water Authority will continue to have issues with water quality uh, and in some cases water quantity. And the cost of uh, clean water for people on a day-to-day -day basis could actually spiral out of control and cause economic problems for many people uh, in the community. And we really got to think about water and how we build water to last 100 years. And, and then how do we build it so that it becomes an asset, right? Every year we keep investing in it. Then we've got this asset that, um, you know, um, will uh, improve the economies of our cities and the economies of our state and our nation. Cities like Grand Rapids require 
an awful lot of water in order to be successful. A city like Grand Rapids is going to continue to grow. And you look at this city here, you look at the, the construction that's going on right now here at the Amway Grand. You look at all of the things that have happened. This community has grown in part because of economic leadership, but also access to water. And, and you can't mistake the fact that when you look at even the early developments here in the United States, most communities ended up being built along the water's edge. And we will see a return to communities along the water's edge being the, the primary communities for our populations. The world and the United States as well are currently facing a problem of growing debt, debt at the national, state, and local level. And how we deal with that and how that affects our water systems is going to be one of the key questions facing us. Our poorest red and blue communities across America simply can't afford uh, to meet federal law in many cases. They can't afford to maintain their existing system. The cost of this is, is something that we want our tax dollars to help pay for. The rate payers and, and the individual is not going to pay for all this. Um, it should be the responsibility of a partnership between uh, uh, us as individuals, but our state dollars and our federal dollars to build this infrastructure, rebuild, renew it. Um, that should be a partnership. So I think both our state dollars and our federal dollars should be helping with restoring this infrastructure. And we should be certainly looking at these areas that have been neglected in the past. Water infrastructure in particular. We're going to pay one, one, way, one way or the other. Flint, just with the, the uh, government money that has been put forward, it's over a billion dollars. Well, the failure in Flint. Yeah. And it would have cost a few dozen million dollars to prevent it in the first place. We're going to pay sooner or later. And so I think the lesson is we better get busy. We better start investing in water infrastructure. What happened in Flint? is an example of what's going to happen to hundreds of communities across the United States. And we don't presently have a paradigm by which we can help them. Right now, our paradigm is you get the water you can afford. And uh, short of a water crisis, no one's going to help you. And maybe we should consider changing that. One of the water pipes that uh, will be bringing Lake Michigan water into Waukesha, Wisconsin. This is a project that is somewhat controversial in this community for a couple of reasons. One, the cost. It's going to be somewhere between 200 and 600 million dollars to divert water from Lake Michigan, bring it in about 17 miles to a community of about 70,000 people. This is the first time that the governors of the Great Lakes states and the government of Canada have allowed a community to take water out of the Great Lakes and use it for their municipal use. And of course this sets a precedent. And the question is, will this then lead to a series of requests from communities outside the Great Lakes Basin to have access to Great Lakes water? Is it the beginning of a long series of water diversion projects moving water out of the Great Lakes Basin into communities that are no longer really a part of the Great Lakes Compact. It's a controversial issue. It's expensive and uh, in some ways it also uh, questions the strategic thinking of city planners uh, and people who are looking at long-range economic development. Is it really advantageous to be diverting water to communities outside the Great Lakes Basin? Would it be more economical to incentivize 
communities to move into the Great Lakes Basin and to create business sectors, business communities that are already in the Great Lakes Basin. These are questions I think people need to sort out. But again, as I point out, this is the beginning of what will probably be a long-standing controversy and one that isn't going to be settled very easily because everybody outside the Great Lakes Basin is going to want to have a share of the Great Lakes water. You know, when you think about water and you think about quantity, uh, people understand quantity. You know, it's a glass of water, or a volume in a swimming pool, and we measure it pretty well. And in fact, we are able to yeah, use remote sensing and, and all types of technologies to really understand quantity. Quality, on the other hand, is so complex. So I always say quality is really a reflection of what we do on the land and how precipitation and runoff affect our waters. We really need to invest in some of the new technologies that we have for measuring water quality in space and time, the changes, and what we want to do to protect water quality. And the best way to do this is actually create water centers, which are basically water applied testing and environmental research centers. Why do we need a water center, you think? Well, there's good reasons for it. The creation of a water center would identify emerging and existing threats to our community drinking water. America's drinking water quality is quite good when it's measured in the context of providing a decent quality product at very low cost. Certainly other countries do exceed American standards, but they pay a lot more for it. And so in some ways you get what you pay for. The, the emerging pathogens, the emerging contaminants that we wanna measure, you know, are growing every day. And it's quite expensive to do monitoring. I'm in Saginaw, Michigan. This is the Saginaw River behind me. It hooks up to the Chittabawassee River. The Chittabawassee River runs back up into central Michigan area towards Midland, Dow Chemical Plants up there. The city of Saginaw used to be a lumbering town. Uh, it's downsized considerably over time. But the Saginaw River flows through here and goes out into the Saginaw Bay. And when we look at the city of Saginaw, when we think about the water here, the water quality is affected by many things, including upstream sewage discharges from uh, communities like Flint, Michigan, or uh, chemical discharges from communities like uh, Midland. And so everything that flows through here eventually ends up out in the Saginaw Bay. One of the areas that we've been very concerned about is, of course, the water. And uh, in that context, persistent toxic chemicals. Uh, one of the issues that we became aware of were the PCBs. PCBs, uh, again, a persistent toxic chemical that was found in the water, was used by GM. General Motors, locally, stepped up to the plate relatively quickly and worked on addressing the PCBs in their tiles in their factory and also those that got out of the factory in, the terms, of, in terms of blocks, building material that was removed, and also what was discharged in the water. They funded dredging uh, and they, they dealt with the issue rather quickly. On the other hand, another major manufacturer in the area, Dow Chemical Company, produced what's called 2378 TCDD, commonly referred to as dioxin, which is also a persistent toxic chemical. PCBs performed a function. Uh, it was very, very resistant to heat and uh, again very persistent, didn't, didn't uh, uh, degenerate or, or break down very easily, so industry welcomed it. Uh, they welcomed it in generators and those sorts of things. So, and in oils. Uh, on the other hand, dioxin was an unwanted waste product of the production of pesticides and chlorinated solvents and those sorts of things that came out of uh, Dow Manufacturing in Midland. Uh, they ended up in the water, in the air, in the bay, in the Titabawassee River, 
and ultimately in the Saginaw River. And when extreme numbers were discovered in wetlands adjacent to the Titabawasi River, Dow was very reluctant to accept responsibility or even accept that these were toxic materials that needed to be addressed. Ultimately, the EPA stepped in, we had an agreement, and the good news is that over the last decade, Dow has finally stepped up to the plate. And uh, the Titabawasi, um, the area in the Titabawasi adjacent to the plant, many, not only dioxin, but many toxic substances were removed uh, under the oversight of uh, what is now EGLE, what then was Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the, uh, uh, the EPA, uh, and uh, a civilian or citizen oversight group called the Community Advisory Group, the CAG, which I am a member of. Uh, in that decade, uh, whole stretches of the Titabawasi River, in fact, all of the Titabawasi River, starting with the plant, down to where it conjoins with the Saginaw River. The banks have been fortified, been, been stabilized. Uh, dioxins have been removed or again stabilized in the sediment. And uh, there is regular sampling that goes on. And we are very hopeful that the Titabawasi River will be the river that historically it used to be. We are now up to the Saginaw River and uh, the island in the Saginaw River called the Middle Grounds, which has residents on the southern end. I'm in Bay City, Michigan at a super fun site where industrial chemicals have been dumped for many years and now it's a cleanup site. There's PFAS here, there's a whole bunch of other chemicals, carcinogens, and, and these have been leaking into the Saginaw River leaking into the Saginaw Bay, leaking into Lake Huron for years. Uh, we believe the Middle Grounds landfill has been stabilized. Over the many decades, uh, corporations like Dow Chemical put things into our water system as a part of their industrial process. And at the time, whether they did or didn't know that it would add to the pollution of our drinking water, may not have received the attention it needed. You know, for a long time, people felt that you just can dilute things into the water and eventually it will become uh, something that isn't a threat. We've learned over time that that's not true. Dow uh, has been a responsible corporate citizen they placed dioxins in the Titabawasi, Saginaw River system, and they have spent uh, millions of dollars cleaning it up. Uh, and that's what we need more of. We need more private corporations to step up and clean up the mess that they contributed to and have a public-private partnership take place. When we're doing this, we all benefit. And we have to think about the long-term effect of chemicals. But we're not done with, uh, obviously, toxic chemicals. That was the good news. The bad news that the, is, there, is that there is another one out there, the so-called uh, forever chemicals, PFAS, another persistent toxic chemical. We have to address the need to regulate these things before, before they get out into the environment. That's sometimes called a prevention principle. Uh, because it is so hard to address them afterwards. And for uh, those who don't know what the forever chemicals are, they're, they're, consider, they're called PFAS because the chemical name is very difficult to pronounce. And uh, PFAS was used to retard fires. They are persistent and once more they are toxic. So we've got over 20,000 contaminated sites in Michigan. That is definitely the bad news. And we need to test to figure out what these chemicals are doing to all of the organisms, human and other, that, that rely on water for survival. And 
we can do this if we work together and if we're genuine and honest and open about our intention to make sure that there is enough sustainable water to, to keep life going on this planet. And again, uh, one corporation has stepped up. If all the corporations would step up and did this as uh, a part of being a good corporate citizen, we would all benefit, all of us. Unless we start changing the way we introduce chemicals into our environment, we're going to have a chronic problem with cleaning these things out and keeping people healthy. We have to be mindful that the public health approach to prevention is something that we should be applying to water just like we apply it to other things. So that includes defining the problem through surveillance, identifying causes and risks uh, or the protective factors through research, developing and testing interventions, implementing those interventions, and then evaluating interventions. I do think there's a, a, an important and legitimate role for public health agencies to think beyond simply providing services to people with health needs. Clearly that's part of the mission. But it's, it's a public responsibility, not just to pull people out of the river, but to move upstream and see where they're falling in. A public health agency has to balance mm -hmm. the resources that it places in filling the gaps in our health delivery system, which are real and yeah. we need to focus on, but also to try to find ways to positively affect public health, community health more generally. Public health agencies in the Great Lakes region can be involved in a water center concept. They can provide the PCR testing, for instance, for pathogens, like many are doing now during the COVID-19 epidemic. By looking at the water going through the sewage systems, they're able, for instance, to determine the extent of the epidemic in a community. We can measure for pathogens at the front end at the uh, community water source and at the back end, so to speak, where the sewage is taking place. So we've got to be very strategic about how we look at quality, how we combine data and modeling for predictions. You know, and this goes back to who's polluting, who's changing the water quality when they discharge, and what kind of water quality do we need for all our uses? for recreation, for fishing, for drinking, for various types of industry. We're blessed with a lot of water, but there's some industries that need very highly purified water, like the chip industry. So we have the quantity, let's make sure that we've got the quality that they need as well. Water treatment centers in communities can work with public health agencies to develop a water quality index and make the public aware of the quantity and quality of water at a given time. Wastewater facilities play an important role in the one water model. The sewage that comes through these facilities can be reused, repurposed. In addition, the sewage can be analyzed by water centers to determine what kind of contaminants exist in the community water supply. Do we need a federally sponsored water center to pull together all of the interested parties to develop a strategic plan for managing Great Lakes water quality and quantity. I think it would be tremendously valuable. Number one, we sit right here in the, uh, surrounded by the greatest source of fresh water in the known universe. Now we always say it's the greatest source of fresh water on the planet. Yeah. It's the greatest source of fresh water in the known universe. Yeah. We might as well claim it, right? Yeah, yeah I would say so. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think we not only have the opportunity, yeah. but because of that, an obligation uh, to continue an aggressive research agenda around the safety of the Great Lakes, the sanctity of those Great Lakes, how we preserve that water source for generations to come, but also some of the specific questions about how we manage such an incredible uh, water source are unanswered. trust the Environmental Protection Agency to look out for our drinking water, our air, for the quality of our environment. The question has been raised, does the Environmental Protection Agency 
really fulfill all of our expectations? Does it live up to the standards that we have now in a modern world? If the philosophy of regulation is that everything is safe until it's absolutely proven otherwise, that's not the standard I think we want to have. Too often what happens, and I've seen this in the hearings we've held in Washington, is that people in industry will say there needs, they'll say there needs to be more science, more mm. science, more yeah. science. Well, I agree there needs to be more science, but when we have enough information that we, that, that's actionable, we should take action. In a 21st century, is the Environmental Protection Agency needing to go through some reevaluation, some self-evaluation to determine whether or not they're doing everything they can? I think an epidemiologist would like to have data in real time and look at what's happening to the population health issues and then look at whether there's a relationship. Right. And, and, I, and I do think it does come to this question uh, of what our assumption is. Yeah. And the assumption should be that chemicals that have otherwise proven to be dangerous that can be kept out of drinking water ought to be kept out of drinking yeah. water. When we think about clean water, for instance, are we testing for enough chemicals? Are we testing for pathogens? Are we doing daily testing in critical areas, such as in hospitals or school systems, or where there are vulnerable populations like nursing homes? The question is, our drinking water, how good is it every day? Maybe it's good one day, not good another. If we had a water quality index every day in every major community, we'd have a pretty good idea whether our water quality is good. And if we had a water quantity index, we could determine whether the water we have in our systems is going to be enough to take care of our populations. And we should be probably setting up water centers or some kind of distribution process to be able to fully operate uh, our water systems in some kind of strategic coordinated fashion so that we're not just expecting that the water is going to supply us indefinitely. There should be a strategy involved. Now when we look at the Great Lakes, 20% of the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes. Do we really have a handle on how that water is being managed? Should we do more? I have 30 years experience working on the front line of what is considered to be the foremost battlefield of public health in the 21st century for drinking water, which is what happens to water in buildings. That's where the problems with lead, copper, legionella, and other bacteria occur. We know that the, the plumbing system, the pipe system is getting older. Whenever you're working in a new area, uh, there's going to be resistance to that. Traditionally, the water utilities have only been responsible for the quality water up to the property line. And despite federal regulation in terms of the EPA lead and copper rule that gave them responsibility all the way to the tap, they've been very, very reluctant to take that responsibility on. And in many ways, they've subverted the intent of the regulations, including the EPA lead and copper rule. And it's that sort of unethical behavior, unfortunately, that gave us our foremost water crises of this century, the 2001 to 2004 lead and drinking water crisis in Washington, DC, and the 2014, 2016 water crisis, which was due to lead and legionella in Flint, Michigan. It's a really tough situation to be in when the environmental policemen essentially become the environmental criminals and cover these problems up. If we had a water center, we wouldn't have had the crisis, for instance, we experienced in Flint. All of our laws around water um, always need updating, and the Safe Drinking Water Act has built into it a, um, a system for um, re-evaluation 
and updating the law as need be. And of course, there's always updates to the rules that are being implemented to meet the goals of the, the Safe Drinking Water Act. When it comes to water quality problems in buildings, however, generally speaking, the regulations don't apply to the bad things that happen in the buildings, with the exception of lead and copper, which we've botched horribly. And so things like Legionella, Mycobacteria avium, and other premise plumbing pathogens, right now that responsibility falls completely, for better or worse, on the building manager, operator, and or the homeowner to address. Maybe 10 years from now, it'll be a different situation. You know, one area that the Safe Drinking Water Act doesn't um, probably adequately address at this time um, is the distribution system and premise plumbing in our, in our uh, buildings. And we know that's where Legionnaire's disease is a, is a problem. And so we need more information, we need more data, and then we need to uh, develop um, building safety plans. Um, we need partnerships between the water utility and, and those people that, that um, you know, manage the buildings so that we truly have safe water at the tap because ultimately that's what the Safe Drinking Water Act says. We're going to have safe water at the tap across the nation. While we know that the federal government does have regulatory authority that it can use now to strengthen the Clean Drinking Water Act, in other words, to make a finding, just picking one subject, a finding that PFAS mm. is dangerous in drinking water, even, even though right now there isn't anything in the law that requires that, the, the EPA would have the authority, under their normal regulatory authority, to make a finding that a dangerous substance is present in drinking water and that that, that would trigger you know, some enforcement action against a, a water system or a polluter. We think they have the authority to do that. We're pushing them to do everything they can. But it's preferable that we pass law that requires it. Um, certainly we have new contaminants of concern. In the United States, a, a recent three-year study revealed that there's 200 unregulated chemicals in the tap water of 45 states. There's a couple thousand chemicals that have been released through the industrial age in the United States that is in our groundwater, that is in our surface water, that is in our water. But we're not measuring all of those things. 20 years ago, I would just say, Boy, we have the best drinking water in the world. We don't have to worry when we go to a tap any place in the United States to, you know, take a glass of water and drink it. You know, 20 years later, I am worried that we have pockets in the United States where the citizens are not getting safe water. Hi, I'm Stacy Taylor. We're about 20 minutes south of Flint. Great little community. We bought our house, little dirt road, tree line, kind of beautiful. Well, it turns out the 40 acres of woods next to my house aren't just woods. They're a toxic dump. Problem is, is that now this dump uh, is not 2,000 feet away from the class one community wells for this development. It's the Marshall Sandstone Aquifer. It is unprotected by a seven foot continuous clay barrier at this location. Underneath this large development, which is almost 200 acres, uh, is a reed charge station for the drinking water. And some folks in town started to have a conversation on, anybody think there's any problems with the drinking water in Holly? The site was closed for soil contamination uh, for cadmium, mercury, uh, zinc, uh, arsenic, lead, phenanthrian, pyrene. They have now tested 23 of the wells. We know that they have PFAS in 15 of the 23. Nine wells have still yet to be tested. The house south of the dump, Ted's lived there 22 years, and he has six types of PFAS in his water, including PFOAs, which are more than double over the state standard. We've got multiple things going wrong at this location, and all of it will affect the human health and safety. For the most part, we have taken for granted the fact that you go to the, to the sink, go to the tap, turn on the water, and it's going to be safe. The assumption is that all the systems are in place, 
that all the regulations are there, that all the capacity to make sure that it's drinkable, safe water have long since been established. I mean, this is the 21st century, the United States of America, water's got to be safe. Yeah. We shouldn't assume that anymore. And Flint taught us that, I think. If we get the lesson of Flint, it's that we shouldn't take anything for granted. I'm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to draw attention to the fact that this city had the largest outbreak of waterborne pathogens in their drinking water in the United States. In 1993, 1.6 million people were exposed to cryptosporidium. Over 400,000 of them became ill. And the reason that they did is because there isn't a daily report, a water quality index in America. Had there been, those people would probably have taken action to avoid the drinking water. And the alarm would have sounded. The same thing existed in 2015 in Flint, Michigan. No water quality index, no daily water testing. The result is we have an outbreak that has affected probably 600,000 people. This is happening in America on a regular basis. We just don't know it because we're not doing the testing. And because we don't have a water quality index, we don't have daily testing of water content, we can't do the epidemiological studies to determine how the drinking water is affecting health. We can't determine if there is a connection between drinking water, a correlation or maybe causation for other kinds of illnesses that are taking place in our communities. So we put people at risk and we could be avoiding the risk if we just practiced uh, a little bit of preventive strategy. This is where public health needs to step in and become much more involved in community drinking water. Because in communities like Milwaukee here, where we have a million people living, we need to have something that gives the public information they can use. And this should happen in every community in America. I really think that the idea of looking at the, not just the urban communities, but our rural communities is going to be important. And while drinking water is always, you know, right uh, front and center in our minds, we're so intimate with, with our tap water and, and um, our clean water systems, we should not be forgetting our wastewater systems. And that is wastewater treatment, wastewater collection, wastewater treatment is probably one of the greatest public health endeavors of all times in terms of protection of our health. In the Great Lakes region, we have not invested as much as we should have in advanced wastewater treatment and or resource recovery where we can get water, we can get nutrients, we can get energy even out of managing our waste systems and even our animal waste systems. So we're gonna have to think about that in the future and really focus on this resource recovery approach. Um, in one way, we can jumpstart and move to some of the really advanced technologies because we haven't invested yet. But that's what's going to have to happen in the Great Lakes is we're really gonna to have to think about our, both our animal waste and our, uh, and our human wastewater um, uh, management. Yeah, and we know in the West that those big outbreaks that we've had with E. coli, O157, some pretty serious national outbreaks associated with lettuce and, and other produce um, was likely due to animal waste um, contamination of irrigation waters. And in this region, we're likely to see more irrigation um, because of the variability in climate. And we do have these CAFOs, so we've got to think about could we treat animal waste, recover the nutrients um, safely um, to apply to the land and not be contaminating our waterways. Um, I think the other intersection between climate and the pollution of the Great Lakes is the storm events and our wastewater infrastructure. Because all wastewater systems are kind of leaky. And here we still have combined sewer overflows that while we're fixing them, when we get these higher precipitation events, we still have overflows of untreated or partially treated wastewater going into our water systems, into our rivers. 
and um, or we have uh, blending facilities, wastewater systems that blend. Um, we don't want our wastewater treatment plants to be washed out, but we have got to invest in ways to take care of these high flows that really impact our uh, wastewater infrastructure. I grew up on the shores of Lake Erie and saw that lake literally dead and come back to life uh, through regulation, Clean Water Act. And so I've seen what humans can do, both in terms of bad and good. And I'm very optimistic about our future and the fact that we'll probably get our act together. And certainly the whole issue of how to deal with these things and the cost benefits are important political and social debates that we have to have, but I, I think we'll muddle through. So you've heard that water is life and water is an asset and we shouldn't take it for granted. Yet, maybe we don't know what's in the water now, and maybe it isn't as good as it was at one time. We've seen a lot of this in our distribution of water, partly because people are saying that maybe the water from our tap isn't as good. Again, this is really creating some concerns. And we do have areas of concern in the Great Lakes, and there's an attempt to mitigate it. Millions of dollars is going to be spent trying to clean up sites that have been contaminated. But more importantly, we need to let people and communities know what the quality of their water is. If it isn't that good, then they need to do something about it. And that might mean new water treatment facilities, new piping, maybe home filtering systems. These are the kinds of things that we need to step up to. The Great Lakes has an abundance of water, more water than probably any other region in North America. But if water is life and we want water to be an asset, we're gonna to have to treat it better. We're gonna to have to all be involved in the conservation of water because there is a scarcity in some parts of the country, and also looking at the quality of water so that we have a better idea of what's in the water. And if there are contaminants here and pathogens, we need to do something to mitigate it so that people stay healthy. Water is still life, as long as we're willing to keep it that way. <laughs>